you guys ready for the word of God? All right. We're in a series called uh, The Good Life. And we're talking about Joseph. He's the guy who was sold by his brothers. Which, in my opinion, I was talking to my wife yesterday, was the most despicable thing you can do. Sell somebody into slavery. I think it would be easier, right? in my opinion, to die than to be sold into slavery. Why do I believe slavery is so bad? Because um, people own you. They can do whatever they want with you. They can abuse you. You have no freedom. They can use you. They can sell you. They can sell you into prostitution. Oftentimes, men would take advantage of young girls especially in that culture they would do whatever they want with them they use them as a work slave sex slave whatever that would be evil and that would be horrible and uh, there wasn't just uh, girls who were sold into slave boys were sold into slavery and we know that the world was just as perverse then as it is today and we know what some men do to boys and how some people abuse children. We know that that happened then. And we know that Joseph was very good looking. So his brother is selling him into slavery. It was horrible. But here's what the twist of Joseph's story is. Is that God was with Joseph as a slave. Then Potiphar's wife, which is his master's uh, wife has lust for Joseph and goes up to Joseph and, and Joseph refuses to sleep with her. So she accuses him of rape and they throw him in prison for another seven years. And the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph there. And then after about 14 years, when Joseph was about 30 years old, God delivers him miraculously from prison. And guess where he puts him? Into the palace. He puts him second in command of Egypt. Okay, he becomes like an adopted son of Pharaoh, the most powerful man on earth. And as we go further, famine hits the land and his brothers come not knowing that Joseph is now the prince of Egypt. And he reveals himself to his brothers. And last week we talked about why would God allow this to happen in the family. And we said God is a master planner. Who worked through, works through many generations. He has a big plan for, for their life. To, yes, uh, last week I talked about four generations of believers. How many of you remember that? The first generation is on fire for God. Second generation tries to imitate their parents. So they try to imitate that fire. The third generation rebels against the second generation because second generation by trying to imitate the first becomes religious okay they become religious they don't want anything new they want to sing the same songs wear the same clothes preach the same sermons that the first generation preached we call that religion and then when third generation grows up they said i want nothing to do with that because i have not seen true power of god I have seen an imit imitation of my grandparents, right? And then the fourth generation, totally, you can't even tell the difference. Fourth generation believer between the world. They're about the same. And so after preaching this message last week, my daughter at the dinner table asked, she said, Dad, she's kind of down. She said, Dad, do we have no hope? Because we're like uh, fourth generation. And I said, I think I need to preach this message again. <laughs> to explain what the hope of our faith is. <laughs> I love when my kids ask me questions. You know, they ask simple questions, but profound. You know, a lot of times the most profound things are simple. The biggest revelation God gives us are not very confusing. They're like, duh, the kingdom of heaven is like the... Fishermen. Whoa, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is like fishermen, you know, catching fish. It is like a woman who lost the coin. It is like uh, uh, the ten virgins. It is. It's simple. The most 
profound things in the Bible are simple and make sense to where the child can even understand them. If a person is standing before you and giving you all this theological great mumbo jumbo, I don't think he even understands it. Not, if it's not practical, look at Jesus, the greatest preacher and teacher on earth. Very practical, people can understand. A child can understand. He speaks to multiple levels. Anyway, why am I going this way? <laughs> so there's three generations. And Israel in Joseph's day was about to be no more. It was about to be absorbed into the nations, pagan nations around them. And if that happened, Jesus Christ couldn't come. Because he had to come through this family. Family of Abraham, first generation. Isaac, second generation. Jacob, third generation. And now Jacob's 12 sons, fourth generation. We know that Jacob's sons are the most godless people in that time. They're more godless. And this is what happens to, to third or fourth generation. Godless. <laughs> Parents could be preachers. Children could be godless. Why? Because they never found God for themselves. Do you go to church to please your parents, your grandma? Is that the tape that's playing in your head? I have to go to church because my grandma. Or are you going to church so you can know God for yourself, so he can lead you and guide you? Joseph's brothers were godless. And they started marrying godless women. And they were one generation away from extinction as the nation of Israel. Nation of Israel. So how can God take godless people, fourth generation, and turn them into godly men? How can God take godless people and make them godly men? And that's what we're going to talk about today. What did it take for the fourth generation of believers to believe? What did it take for the fourth generation of believers to believe? How can we make sure, if you're a third generation today, by birth, meaning you, your mama was a Christian and your grandma was a Christian, you're a third generation by birth, how can you become the first generation by choice? I am a third generation by birth. On my mom's side, on my dad's side, I'm a fourth generation by birth. I'm a first generation by choice. By choice. I'm the third or fourth generation by birth. Many of you are too. I'm a first generation by choice. Personal choice. I'm, I chose to follow Christ. Or he chose me. I don't know which way it works. But it's kind of both. It depends. If you're a Calvinist, you think he chose you. If you're a Arminianist, you think you chose him. It's somewhere in between there. Okay? So we'll just, uh, we'll just leave that one for another day. All right. Now, <clears throat> if we look at the business world... We can see the same patterns, and I'll show you, as it is in a, in, in a Christian world. If we look at the business world, you can see the same pattern as it is in a Christian world. For example, the first generation starts something. The first generation builds something. The second generation maintains or runs something. So first starts, second runs third ruins did you know that statistically speaking before the business could um, transfer from one generation to the second um, family-owned business 70 percent of businesses will fail or sell or disappear first generation they'll never pass to second generation 70 percent of businesses will never pass to the second generation so only 30 do now out of those 30 only 10 percent of them pass to the third generation first generation starts it second generation runs it third generation bankrupts it <laughs> first generation builds it second generation maintains it third generation destroys it now not all cases but like i said 70 percent 
fails in the second generation, only 10% succeeds in the third generation. If we look at the Bible, guys, if we look at the Bible, we see a similar pattern. First generation seeks God with all their heart. Second generation tries to recreate what the first generation experienced. And third and fourth generation rebels and walks away from God altogether. We see that pattern in the Bible. I'll show it to you in a second. First generation builds church buildings. They do church programs. Usually they start in a home somewhere or in a garage. Then they go to the storefronts or mall spaces or schools or theaters and start churches there. And then they make a big uh, money gathering um, fundraising thing. They build churches. They build buildings. You know, we, first generation, we bought this building. Nobody helped us. No denomination was there to, to build us this building or, or help us purchase this building and even remodel this building. First generation built something great. Second generation maintains the buildings and status quo. Their bills are paid usually because the first generation provided. Second generation, the bills are paid. Churches are paid for. So now um, we just maintain. So we sing the same songs. We've got to maintain. We saw the power of God in our, in our parents. And in order for us to, be, to receive that same power, we've got to be like them. In order of, uh, for us to experience the Azusa revival, we got to go there. We got to lay on a concrete in Los Angeles. We got to fall asleep on that concrete and we'll see angels. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on. Sounds like a joke, right? Some people even went to graves. You know who I'm talking about. They went to graves of people from first generation who died. I know a famous preacher who's still alive today, said it himself, went to the grave of Catherine Kuhlman so he can receive the anointing from the bones. Now, there is a verse in the Bible about bones. Of, I know that. But you have Holy Spirit now living inside of you. And that going to the grave sounds more like some kind of a pagan tradition then it is a biblical thing. First generation builds it. Second generation maintains it. I look at my parents. The only thing they told me, you got to be like we were, like our parents were. Well, here's the thing, Mom. I love you. It's her birthday today. <laughs> I love my mom. But guess what? I never, I wasn't even born when they went through what they went through. My parents grew up under communism. So you know what was the main point to be a Christian under communism? Is don't lose your faith. Just don't do whatever you do. Don't lose your faith. There was no progress. You couldn't go on the streets and evangelize. So you had to kind of be in this small underground churches. I still remember as a kid, my mom dragged me to underground churches. And guess what my parents talked about? And still do. How they had to make sure that KGB agents weren't watching them as they were going to church. Because KGB agents would come and be looking on the bus stations to see where a, a lot of people are going on Sunday morning. You know, most people are having a hangover on a Sunday morning. As it is here, so it is there. <laughs> they do vodka there very well. Homemade. <laughs> out of potatoes <laughs> okay and so they were hung over really hung over and so the, my parents would always be looking behind their back to make sure that and my dad told me one day kgbs came to this house and people started jumping out of windows <laughs> and my dad says those are no good christians no good um uh, you know the good ones they stayed they got a fine for it you get, get a fine you get a fine and they would always ask, who is the pastor? Because they always wanted to get the pastor. And so what would they, they do is they wouldn't call anybody a pastor. Why? 
they would have multiple pastors. So if they would ask, he would say, no, I'm not the pastor. Although he is the pastor, but he doesn't hold that title. There's multiple people, and there would be multiple people preaching. So it was a different world. We don't have to jump out of windows. We don't have any. <laughs> How do you jump out of a window now? <laughs> there is a little one on this side, but it's, you'd have to like tear down the wall, and we wouldn't let you do that. <laughs> But they had to go through something that we will probably never have to go through. But we will have to go through something that they will probably never, ever go through. We have to stand up. See, Jesus says, God says, sing to him a new song. He says, look, I'm doing a new thing. God is always, see, the Bible doesn't change. But the song melodies do. <laughs> if you, if now that I know what's going on, when I listen to the melodies of the songs of my parents, they were melodies from the secular songs with Christian words in them. And then I'd show my mom. I said, Mom, this song that you loved so much was actually written in America. They took the melody, put words to it, and Beatles was the one who was singing it. <laughs> no, no, no. She doesn't want to admit that. True story. I mean, I, I debate with my mom like that. <laughs> what are you laughing at <laughs> over there? <laughs> what my parents went through was real. What they went through is real. However, what, want, what God wants to do in my life is also real. And it is for today. And it is for the people and for the culture, for the city that I'm living in. You know that God wants to use you not to retain the faith of your parents, but he wants to use you to reach the city. He wants to use you to reach people who are dying without Christ and going to hell. Do you know that God loves this city? And he says, you are my hands and you are my feet. But second generation does not evangelize. Second generation, what do they do? Maintain. Maintain. And here's what second generation usually says. If God wants to bring people to our church, he can do it. He's God. And they deny the part that says, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. He who, is believed, he who believes and will be baptized will be saved. He who doesn't believe will be condemned. That's what God says for us to do. That's what Jesus, our greatest example, tells us to do. But second generation maintains. Third generation completely rebels, so they don't evangelize either. They actually hate, hate Christianity. Third generation mock Christianity. They believe somewhere inside, right? Third generation that it's, you know, maybe it's real, but it's 50-50, and they mock it. Like they make fun of our songs and how we talk and how we're all about money. And so that's what, it's, uh, that's what it ends up being. Um, first generation builds it, maintains it. Second generation and third generation sells the church to a developer, church building to the developer. Uh, and in Europe, you know that many churches, Christian churches, where there was a greatest revival in those churches are today sold to Islamic mosques. You know that, right? Churches in Europe are now being sold. If you're a third generation, you're not going to survive. So what's, Pastor, this is depressing. <laughs> I know, that's what my daughter said. <laughs> Unless you become the first generation by choice. You could be fourth generation by birth. But you still have to become a first generation by choice. We see this in the Bible, guys. Look at this. God touches a young boy named David. Right? He kills lions and bears, protecting his sheep. God raises him up. As a teenager, he kills a Goliath, first generation. 
Later, he is chased by another king who's jealous of him. He's writing poetry to God. God, I'm in love with you. The Lord is my shepherd. He lay, makes me lie down in green pastures. <laughs> he leads me beside still water. He restores my soul. You know, he writes all these beautiful uh, poets. Uh, well, they were songs to God. He writes beautiful. He's kind of like Hillsong. Just Hillsongs write about oceans. Somebody said that actually. I'm copying somebody. Hillsongs write about oceans. David wrote about pastures <laughs> and streams, <laughs> right? And so, and so David is in love with God. He wants to please God. He wants to fight God's battles in his generation, right? David is surrounded by pagan nation who want to destroy God. But David says, God with you, I can conquer. I can take the city. And so in David's time, David organizes 12 tribes of Israel. You know who the heads of those tribes are? They're dead by now, but in David's time. But they're 12 Joseph's brothers. 11 Joseph's brothers, right? So he organizes Israel. He restores tabernacle of David, it's called. He wants to build a temple for God, but he kind of messed up in his life. He's a warrior. And God says, no, you can't build a temple for me. Prepare a temple for me, and then your son can build it. So David is passionately in love with God. David grew up in a religious family who doesn't understand him. You're too much, bro. We're Israelites too. We worship true God too. But David says there's more to this faith. I want to have a personal relationship with God. I want to see a miracles of God in my life, in my generation. God, can I trust you with a lion and a bear? God, can I trust you with a Philistine who's twice the size of my height? Can I trust you? David wanted more. Here's the question. Do you want more? Or do you want to repeat what we're doing here? Do you want to repeat what your parents were doing? Or do you want more? I want more. First generation by choice. I want more. Why are you in that church so much? I want more. Why do you pray? I want more. Why do you read your word? I want more. I want more. I want more. And so David builds this great kingdom. He conquers many enemies of Israel and of God, right? David's son Solomon, the wisest fool, I call him. The wisest fool. He takes over the kingdom. He's a ladies' man. Solomon. For being so wise, he's a fool. <laughs> because um, he starts, instead of fighting God's battles, his father prepared everything for him. His life is easy. He inherited the throne. Much silver and gold. He inherited organization, the structure. He inherited the government. David built the government right he inherited the tabernacle and priests and levites everything is in order he inherited that he wouldn't even build a temple except his dad made him promise build this temple here's the plan his dad prepared a plan for him everything so he builds this temple and that's about all he does for god and then instead of fighting the battles he starts marrying the daughters of the kings that are his enemies and he marries them for peace, he says, to keep peace. Instead of fighting the battles, he wants to be passive. Second generation want to be just passive. Let's just be in our little churches. And why, why go out there and preach the gospel? You know, people might hate me. I might be getting uncomfortable. Why, why am I going to go fight out there in a the world when, when... You see where I'm going with this? And so Solomon gets himself in trouble. He starts marrying all these women who are godless women. And they, Bible says, draw him away from God. He starts building temple of Baal, Asherah, in Israel next to the temple he built for God. And, and the Bible says... They turned his heart away from God. And we know by the end of his life, he does repent. He does say it's foolishness, it's stupidity. I, I was a fool. He says that in Ecclesiastes, and he says that in some in Proverbs. So he comes back to God, I believe. 
But then his son comes on the scene. And all he saw was a dad who was religious. All he saw was a dad who said there was this God of power who rescues people, who gives us great victories in battle. But if you don't fight a battle, don't expect to get a victory from a battle. If you never pray for demon-possessed people, don't ever expect to have a story that God cast out a demon out of a person because it's never going to happen. If you don't take risk for the kingdom of God, don't expect to have great testimonies about the kingdom of God. And then his son. So Solomon dies and his son comes in, Rehoboam. And let me read something to you. It's not going to be on your... Uh, guys, not on your part, but it says this. But then, but when Rehoboam was firmly established and strong, he abandoned the law of the Lord, and all Israel followed him in this sin. First generation builds it and fights the battles. First generation, he had to leave his girlfriend because she didn't want to be, you know, like him she didn't want to go to church so he had to sacrifice some things he had to lose some friends second generation they maintain it third generation abandons the lord jacob's boys are fourth generation they are godless more godless than the people who are godless in the (laughs) in the nations around them and i'm not going to repeat how godless they are Listen to last sermons. There's so much in that. They become godless. How does God bring him back? What did it take for the fourth generation of believers to believe? What did it take for Joseph and his brothers to believe? And um, I had more examples of you, for you guys, but I'm running out of time. My time is uh, running out. So how do you make sure that your parents' faith, if you're second, third generation, becomes your own? Number one, if you're writing this down, write this down, please. Seek God for yourself. Seek God for yourself. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, let's put it up in the screen. It says, for, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he's a, he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Okay? So here's point number one. You cannot please God with your parents' faith. You cannot see the miracles of God in your life with your parents' faith. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Not that my parents believe that he is. You must come to God with your own convictions. You must come to God with your own beliefs, not your grandma's beliefs. You must draw from the well directly, not from somebody else's well. That's why I tell our band, you guys got to keep writing songs. You cannot stop. And let us sing just the songs of the past. you got to keep writing. Like that, that song, Your Love is Marching Around Me Today. That was awesome. There's got to be more songs like that. And God wants to give you the songs. You know, second generation usually preaches the sermons of the first generation. And so they draw from other preachers instead of drawing from the... Oh, well of the living water me preaching to you on sunday should not be the end you should draw for yourself there's a geico commercial that says 15 minutes will save you help me out 50 percent on car insurance well, I want to I wanna just tell you, 15 minutes in the Word will save you 15 hours of stress and anxiety and fear. 15 minutes in the Word will save you 15 hours. 
I love that. I love that. That's all it takes. If you're new, where do you start? Start in the book of Luke. Or in the book of Mark, whatever. Mark is shorter, but Luke is more descriptive. So maybe start, if you're a woman, in the book of Luke. If you're a man, in the book of Mark. And then once you read that, just switch it. Okay? Mark is shorter, I'm just telling you. I know my wife loves thick books. I do audio. So, um, amen. <laughs> and all the men said, amen. Amen. <laughs> Seek God for yourself. See, we can learn from these heroes of faith. This is, listen, I'm not putting down these men and women of God like Billy Graham. He was an awesome man who reached millions. And, and I can only hope that someday I can be just a, a little poor for what he has done. But, but I'm never going to be him. And we, we don't live in the same time. There is no Nixon. There is no Reagan. There is no Kennedy. You know, he lived through that age you know we're, we're in a different time we, we we face different challenges but here's the truth the word of God is the same yesterday today and forevermore so it applies for them the way it did and it applies for us the way it will do so the word doesn't change our methods and our words uh, communication change there's some words we don't use anymore uh, right uh, so we gotta seek God you gotta seek God for yourself I remember at 19 years old I had a crisis and I was like in the middle am I gonna serve God or am I gonna just be you know because I felt like my one foot was in 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 God and one foot was in the world you know 50 50 I'm a 50 50 man 50 cent 50 50 cent <laughs> <sighs> all right and so um, I'm like am I gonna serve God and um, and I don't know what happened I don't know how but God touched my life because I started seeking him and I said I made a commitment I remember that I said God I don't want to be a hypocritical Christian 50 50 that's not me I want to be committed to something 100 percent either I'm going to serve you 100 percent or I'm going to serve the devil 100 percent because even Jesus said this right you're neither uh, hot nor you're cold he said you're lukewarm and I'm going to spit you out of my mouth God doesn't like uh, in the middle God says, you choose. Life, death, blessing, cursing. You choose me, the devil, the world, whatever. But don't be, you can't serve two masters. And that's what I was doing. And I made the decision, and I still remember that changed my life, that commitment. And today, when my faith kind of wa wavers sometimes, you know, you go through different things in, in life. Life will, will test you. That's what God did. God designed it to test you. It will always be. And if it's not testing you, it's boring. And boring means um, idle hands are devil's playground. Something like that, right? So, so second generation and third, they're idle because their parents provided everything for them. Their parents did so good. They grew up in a healthy families, right? They grew up and mom and dad worshipped God. They went to church all the time. Stability, you know, dad didn't drink, mom didn't cuss, you know, <laughs> and it was a good home, right? And, and they grew up in this idol. They, there's nothing to challenge them. Here's another clue. If your faith is not challenging you, if, it not, if it's not making you feel awkward, you're not doing it right. If at church you only feel good and nothing ever makes you squirm a little, you're not growing. If you're squirming, I know you're growing and I'm doing my job. If you're just laughing and having a good time, I don't know. I don't know. See, my job here is not to entertain my job is because God is going to ask me, what did you do with the people I give you? And I want to say, say they're champions, God, for Christ. I led them to be champions. I was a good coach who coached them to win for Jesus, for the kingdom of God. I don't want to say, oh, well, I don't know. You know, it was their choice. <laughs> yeah, it is their choice. But good leaders, that's why God sets good leaders. That's why some teams in NFL win. Like Bill Belichick he seems to win all the time. And Browns, Cleveland Browns, <laughs> they will have their day. I'm, I'm believing for them. Just one game at least. One game a season, please, Lord. <laughs> right? Uh, but because of leadership. Good leadership produces good people. Bad leadership produces bad people. 
And so God will ask us as leaders, what have you done? And so my job is not to entertain you. I want to be funny to keep you engaged, but, so please laugh at my jokes, even if they're not funny. It's okay. It's okay to laugh. So I'm like, <laughs> but, um, but the goal is to make you fully devoted follower of Christ. The goal is to help you discover food for yourself and eat for yourself. Food for yourself and eat for yourself. Seek God for yourself. The faith of your parents will not please God in your life. I'm almost done. I got three minutes. So I probably won't go through four points that I have for you. Um, on Friday, Thursday, we were driving to school. And uh, we live out of town a little bit, six miles out of town. And so we have to drive for about 30 minutes from home to school. And we, um, to make sure my kids are not killing each other in a car, I'm like, I found a way. I turn on the Bible, <laughs> and we read through the chapter. And so we're going like third time through the Bible. When they were kids, I told them the Bible, through the whole Bible. I told them, you know, the fun parts, not Leviticus or anything. Um, the fun parts. I went through Genesis to Revelations. So we went two times. This is our third time, right? Third time going through. And... Uh, <laughs> We're going through, and now we're in a Second Chronicles chapter 32. There's a guy named King Hezekiah, and King Hezekiah chooses to serve God. His, his parents were godless, but he himself chose to follow God. Read that chapter. If you look at the Bible, you'll see this. A king chooses to serve God, then his kids don't. For about three to four generations. Then again, another king rises up, and he serves God with all his heart. And then his children kind of walk away and then again Cain rises up and he chooses to serve God he destroys the idols right you know the pattern of the Bible it's the same thing it's the same thing Moses on fire uh, Joshua maintains what happens after Joshua the next generation arose and they did not know God it's like what do you mean you your mentor was Joshua how do you not know God I don't want us to be those people the generation that does not know God and so and so we, we we read this story King Hezekiah he became a godly king and uh, king of Assyria was the superpower of the day in the Hezekiah day and he started conquering all the nations around Israel and finally he came after Israel and King Hezekiah was not able to fight him he was on a roll he had a momentum and so king, uh, this, this king, his name was Sina Cherib. So let's call him Sina, King Sina, since the wrestler, you know, Sina. John Sina, well, King Sina. I know my wrestlers, come on. I know my wrestlers. Uh, and so Sina uh, sent the army. He came to Jerusalem. He conquered actually all Israel, but Jerusalem was the big city, had stone walls. He came. And he knew that he couldn't just come in and break those walls easily. They were strong walls. And so he would send messengers to come to the wall where people were standing, you know, watching this big army outside of the walls. And he would send a message, and the message would say, um, why are you trusting your God to deliver you from me? Is he better than other gods that I destroyed? Because remember, he destroyed all the nations around, and all those nations claimed that they have a God. And he destroyed all those gods and those nations. And, he, and he's intimidating the people of Israel. He's causing their hearts to fear. That's what it says there, right? He was trying to make them fear so they would just... You know, fear makes you weak. That's why the devil gives you fear, guys. Fear makes you... That thing in the stomach. I'm not going to make it. That's what fear does. And fear is, is false. Fear is, a, is, is just an emotion. you got to fight. And, and so he kept bringing these messengers and they would yell, why are you trusting in God? And Hezekiah had enough and he went to the temple and prayed and said, God, we're, if, it, if it's not you, we're not going to be able to fight them. They'll, they'll starve us to death. And it says there, the next day or maybe a few days after that, 
the angel of the Lord goes down into that army and they kill themselves army of Assyrian King Sina but they don't the angels don't kill the um, the Sina so Sina runs away goes back to his country Assyria and the next verse says he was in the temple praying <laughs> here's a God slayer Sina he thought his, himself as a God slayer and then he encountered a true and living God and he lost all his army all his confidence and arrogance and pride he lost all of that right and now he's praying in the but he's not praying to the God of Israel he's trying to pray to his false God who couldn't deliver him who couldn't protect him from the angels that came and created here uh, you know chaos in the in his army so his army killed themselves probably and so as he was praying to a false God his own children came and murdered him Sina's children came this is in the Bible second Chronicles 32 read it it's it's really interesting and my daughter asked me a question the most profound and simple question he says dad but how would he know that Israel had a true God every nation around them claimed that they had a real God and those God has fallen all those gods couldn't protect the people who prayed to them and she said a question and I'm like you're right how would they know everybody claims they have a true God everybody claims they have theology Muslims have a great theology in their own right don't believe it but it's Buddhist new age people Scientologists they all have a theology they all make claims how do we know and that's where I think Jacob's boys were they heard about the God of their grandparents who did miracles but they didn't see any in their own life and so remember the question I asked in the beginning what will it take for the fourth, fourth generation to become believers God had to show himself to these 12 patriarchs who later became godly man how did he do that they sold their brother the brother became prince they ran out of food had to go and help, ask for help he reveals himself and then he says this Genesis let's put the Genesis scripture and I'm gonna end with that 50 19 but Joseph replied don't be afraid of me I am am I God that I can punish you you intended this is Joseph saying to his brothers you intended to harm me but God but God so who is Joseph giving the glory to God who from the standpoint of their brother of the brothers 11 brothers who can do such a thing take a slave and make him prince adopted son of Pharaoh the most powerful man on earth God you think they believed do you think it was enough for them to prove that God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was real? Of course. You know that the names of the 12 um, tribes, tw 12 brothers of Joseph, or 11 brothers of Joseph, 12 sons of Jacob, are written in heaven on the city walls? Read your Bible in the book of Revelations. We see that. If the eternity, if eternity mentions them, that means God can take godless and make him godly but how but how power of God power of God see a lot of our churches can become so theological we we we, we speak the words but we deny the power and I feel like God wants to show his power in your life because when you seek him usually the first generation sees the power of God some in second Jesus disciples you know they see second but then third is totally gone power they just preach Paul says my preaching was not just words but they were a demonstration of spirit and power here's the thing words are great conviction 
Theological conviction is great. But unless you see the power of God in your life, it'll just be words. How do we know our God is real? Because He's powerful. And if you test Him, and if you try Him, not like, show me a trick, God, but like if you ask Him to be a part of your life, He'll come in and show Himself mighty. And I'm a testimony that God can take a person like nobody bring him to a country where he doesn't know a language and bless him and show his power in his life he can do it for me he can do it for you if he can do it for pastor van he can do it for you but you just can't you can't just go to church and do go through the motion you got to seek him and if you seek him with all your heart he will be found by you because he is near to those who seek him God wants to know you personally. God wants to have a relationship with you. He doesn't want you to know Him through your parents. He wants to be your God. God wants to be your God. He wants to show off in your business, in your, in, in your job, in your school. He wants to heal you. He wants to show off in, in, through the life of your children. He wants to do great and mighty things in your life. I got to quit. We're, we're over time. Please stand to your feet. Did you enjoy this message, guys? Thanks for tuning in to New Life Sermon Series Online. If you're blessed by these messages and are interested in helping spread the Word of God to others, make an investment today. You can give at newlifechurchsf.org. If you have a story or a testimony to share, let us know on our website as well. We hope you have a blessed day and enjoy today's message by Pastor Alex.